Good morning. It is 10.54 a.m. on Sunday, March 26th, 2017. I'm Christiana Ellis, and I just got up. This is five more minutes. So, today is Sunday. That means it is time to continue the rewatch of Avatar The Last Airbender. And this week we are on Season 2, Episode 11, The Desert. That's right, right? Um, gosh... Yeah, wait, so, um, the desert, yeah, because last week was the library. The only hesitation there was just that, was last week's called the desert because they were in the desert? No. This week, season two, episode 11, the desert. And in a lot of ways, this one does resemble a two-parter from the last one because of the cliffhanger, Appa's been kidnapped, that we uh, were left. And uh, one of the things that we're, is driven home immediately uh, once we begin this week, is that uh, Appa being stolen is not merely, oh no, poor Appa, we have to get him back, is also, we're now stranded in the middle of the desert. And so that's really uh, not great. It's a pretty dire circumstance for the kids. But one of the things that uh, takes us back a little bit is just the realization that Appa, or excuse me, Aang, is really upset. Now, not that we wouldn't expect him to be upset, but he is upset in a way that we haven't really seen him much before. Uh, accusing his friends, uh, really kind of um, uh, agitated and a little bit mean-spirited. Because, of course, we saw how desperately Toph was trying to both keep the library from sinking and save Appa, and unable to do both, she managed to save the library just long enough to let the, the kids escape. And we saw how much that cost her and how hard that was for her. But Aang is immediately all into blame territory, like, you know, she must have let Appa go because she never liked Appa. And it's really not fair, and we can understand, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a human nature reaction, but it's something that is not usually characteristic of Aang. And so clearly, the loss of Appa on a personal level has bothered Aang a lot more than, you know, more of their day-to-day -day, um, losses. And it, again, it's a twofold thing, you know, it, one, it's, their lives are all in danger, having to try to find their way out of this desert uh, without Appa. But we definitely get the feeling that it's the personal loss that is what really has Aang worked up this way. And so Aang just flies off on his glider, leaving the other kids behind while he goes to go look. And while that might be something where if they all sat down to discuss it and made a plan and he told them, hey, you guys, I'm going to go scout in the sky. You keep moving this direction and I will reunite back with you. Um, that would be one thing, but he doesn't wait for them to make a plan. They don't discuss it. He just takes off. And though I'm sure the kids, you know, given their shared history, have some amount of faith that he's going to return and not just leave them. But uh, they don't decide that in advance. Um, Aang is really unhappy, and it changes him. We see him in this episode do a number of things that were, we would have, considered outside of his normal characterization. And that's not a criticism so much as an observation that Aang has some buttons and uh, those sandbenders stealing Appa pushed one of those buttons pretty darn hard. Um, and we can understand why that would be. I mean, think about the past times that we've seen Aang enter the avatar state. It's almost always when he feels someone that is very close to him has been threatened. Um, and, uh, or when he discovered, uh, definitively at the Southern air temple that all of his, uh, the people he knew were not only dead 
from the time passing, but that they were wiped out and there are no more. So Aang is in rough shape uh, emotionally and the kids are all in rough shape physically because they're in the desert and there is no shade or cover or anything. So it's one thing to say, yeah, they should, uh, they should travel at night and not during the day, but at least they, they don't really have anywhere even to rest and get out of the sun during the day. And I think they were initially hoping that they would only, it seems like from the bit later where they talk about using the star charts, which is pretty clever, that the concern would be without being able to follow the sun, they might not know for sure which direction they're going. It is also just a vague uh, remembering of when they were flying looking for the library on Appa. It's not obvious whether they were at that time charting themselves, like were they paying attention where they were going in their search? It's not clear. But with Appa, you know, able to fly, it kind of also didn't matter as much. They could get up, you know, high and uh, and scout around. But so, uh, in a very real way, this episode depicts the kids as being in more physical danger than most of the other time, other things that they have faced. Because this is not an enemy where you can bide your time and hope for an opening. This is not. Um, someone that could be talked to or reasoned with and there doesn't reasonably seem to be any hope that someone would ever find them and rescue them so there's really no choice but to just start walking and hope that you find something and it's pretty rough uh, they're they're dealing with very little water uh, remaining and there's some fun bits with uh, the idea that uh, Katara is giving everybody her bending water, um, but it's the same bending water she's been using for a while, so it has taste, leftover taste of the swamp people in it. That's funny. Um, and then, you know, we have everyone kind of getting on each other's nerves, like Sokka stops moving and Toph walks into the back of him, and he's annoyed, he's like, why didn't you watch where you're, oh, right, because she can't. And she's frustrated because, you know, she's used to being able to see where she's going, you know, through the vibrations, feeling them with her feet, and this, she can't with the sand. So she's kind of in a, you know, almost, you could argue, worse off than them in the sense that she can't even really, you know, see. Like, she's, that's, uh, but, you know, it's like everyone is in trouble, and so... Uh, uh, Sokka sees the cactus and uh, reasonably concludes that there might be water in it, but uh, unfortunately, he is the one to test it out and discover that there is, in fact, uh, uh, some sort of a hallucinogen in, in that uh, cactus water. So after he starts acting weird, uh, him and Momo... Uh, everyone else decides, yeah, we should maybe not have any of that. And I'm hoping, let's see, my, my camera software, for the weirdest reasons, will just occasionally decide to lock up. So, like, my little preview video looks frozen right now, and I have no way to know what the final result is going to look like. Usually it still stays okay, but I don't understand why it happens. It's very frustrating. I need to get different software to do this with. Anyway, so uh, all the more reason then that uh, they, you know, it, it's, they're, they're in trouble. They're in serious trouble. And then Aang eventually does return to them when it gets dark. And uh, uh, he doesn't want to talk. He's very frustrated, and there's a great moment for Katara here. She gets a couple of great moments this episode where she's just standing there looking at, uh, you know, Toph, who is just feeling lost and helpless, uh, looking at Aang, who's feeling angry and sulky and not wanting to talk to anybody, looking at Sokka and Momo, who are, you know, drugged out and uh, useless, and just realizing, and finding, 
and what's great about it is the sequence is set up to really drive home how helpless this situation must make her feel. But then what we see in her face is that she, she digs deep within herself and finds the resolve to say, you know what? Someone is going to have to just take charge here. I'm going to do it. It's not about being bossy. It's about just, we've just got to keep going. There's no other choice. And so, all right, well, let's look at these star charts and try to figure this out because if we can travel during the night, that'll be easier than traveling during the day. And we, you know, we're going to make a plan and we're going to do it. And it's just this great moment of strength, inner strength for Katara that uh, I really, uh, I really appreciated. So as we kind of uh, can continue though, like if, as we're following the, the kids here, um, we eventually, they reach, uh, they reach this big rock. Oh, uh, no, I take it back. They, I guess they do find the, um, uh, the boat first. So it is a nice moment when they're continuing along and then Toph trips over the bit of this boat and it's a big development and it's a great in the sense that, um, although Sokka unfortunately is still, uh, tripping, uh, everyone else has their, their element of, uh, that they contribute to this whole thing. For example, Toph is the one, you know, trips over it, but also is able to detect from that little bit of contact with it that it's a boat and not just some random bit of wood that they might otherwise just pass on by. Aang is able to clear the sand away with his airbending, and Katara figures out how to pilot the thing. And she kind of just takes control of the group, uh, and it's kind of wonderful to see. And so that's a, a moment uh, of high point that doesn't, they're not, you know, out of danger, but they're certainly a lot better off with this thing than without it. Uh, they decide to follow the, the mark on the compass, even though, you know, it, it's because they're lost, right? They have no idea of what direction maybe they should be going. Um, and for all they know, they would have been going in circles before now, but they, gonna say well at least by following the compass they should be able to go in just a straight line and not be circles and they can go much faster so uh, significant benefit but what it leads them to is this great big rocky area they climb to the top and there's all these weird caves and this is where we get a kind of a weird moment for Sokka of like his first action upon realizing that his mind is clearing is to lick some other bit of strange slime from the wall. And Katara rightly calls him out. I was like, what? What were you thinking? And he's just like, I've got a curious nature. <laughs> but of course, uh, the danger here is that the, the vulture wasps, uh, which is a nasty hybrid, uh, uh, have these tunnels here and now there's more danger escaping those and uh, we see one of the one of these try to fly off with Momo and Aang pursues and this is another element of just how uh, outside himself or his normal so just how worked up Aang is in the sense of he see he goes after to rescue Momo. I'm not going to let you know anyone else get taken away, and that's all very admirable. He and he's going to go save Momo, but then at some point, Momo is safe, and this thing is still fleeing. But Aang has gotten so worked up emotionally that he pursues, and he makes he takes the this wasp down. He you know we don't see it dead. But he blasts it out of the sky with airbending, even after Momo is safe. And that's definitely something Aang normally wouldn't do. He is still in a very dark place. But so in any case, uh, he returns, and this is where we have the kids have been discovered by some sandbenders who are mad that, you know, you stole this ship. But of course, Toph recognizes, hey, one of these people's accusing us is one of the people who stole Appa. And uh, 
it's an interesting challenge here because it, again, this this drives home the the dark place that uh, uh, Ang is in. What is? I don't know what Linda's barking at. Um, it drives home the dark place that Ang is in because uh, while it's reasonable for the kids to rightly confront these sandbenders and say, "We know you did it. We want him back," but Ang is not. You know, there's no discussion about it. Aang immediately starts smashing their other ships, which is a very, uh, you know, violent and and scary way to go about this uh, confrontation. And especially given that it becomes clear that not all of the people there were in on it. Um, and then actually goes into the Avatar state when he realizes that they they don't still have Appa. They've traded Appa away already, you know, on the way to Ba Sing Se. Um, and who knows what Appa might be having done to him in the meantime. They put a muzzle on him. And Aang is so distraught and angry about this that he goes into the Avatar state. And it seems very likely he might just kill all of these people. And this is where we get Katara's really badass second moment in this episode of being able to calm Aang down, not by telling him everything is okay, not by telling him he shouldn't do that, but just by very calmly going to him and just letting him express his anger and sadness in another way and just crying with him. And it's really kind of wonderful. And it's, it is very clearly to my mind, a deepening of their relationship. You know, way, way back in the very first episodes, we had little bits of like, oh, Aang's in love with Katara. He's got kind of a crush on her or something like that. And there's been, you know, there's been little bits and pieces of trying to move that forward in the past that kind of wasn't really working. But this, though it wasn't romantic, was a very deeply intimate, emotional bonding of the two and it calms Aang down and the sandbenders promise to escort the kids out of the, uh, the desert and so at the very least they're no longer in immediate danger but Appa is still not found but it's a that's a this is a powerful episode for for the Aang gang team avatar but we actually have two other plot threads to follow this week, even though they're kind of related. We have Zuko and Iroh, and then we have uh, the the two guys that uh, Toph's father sent after her. So um, we mostly, when we're following them, we're, we're, we're only really seeing them to get a sense of what they're doing in the area and to create tension with uh, what, uh, what Zuko and Iroh are doing. But what Zuko and Iroh are doing is uh, there's a little bit of a fun discussion of, you know, we initially see this badass team of Fire Nation weapons specialists. And so we get to see Iroh, injured as he is, uh, really do a great job taking them out and escaping. But the problem is, you know, the, this, is a, this was a squad that Iroh knew personally and considered friends, and even they are trying to kill them, or capture them at least. And so Zuko kind of points out, it's like, don't you have any friends that don't want to kill you? And Iroh thinks and says, hmm, that's maybe not a bad idea. And so here's where we get the formal introduction of the Order of the White Lotus, which is kind of fun because uh, if you're watching through this series for the first time, you may have not picked up on the idea that way back in season one, episode nine, the waterbending scroll, there was a whole bit where one of the things that the reasons that uh, they were going into town, Zuko and Iroh, is that even though it infuriated Zuko to put the... Uh, the search for the Avatar on hiatus for a moment, uh, Iroh insisted, I need a replacement White Lotus tile for my Pi Show game, and I need it so that I can get on with my life. 
And so the whole reason for that visit was to, uh, seems clear in retrospect that it must have been tied to this Order of the White Lotus thing, which is kind of cool. And we don't know that much about it so far, except that it's clearly a secret society that uh, involves people from various, like the, from the Fire Nation and from the Earth Kingdom at least. And we see that uh, Iroh must be a member and that they are powerful enough to help smuggle them to Ba Sing Se. And that's very exciting. Uh, not only powerful enough, but willing. And so that's very cool. And even though Zuko is kind of frustrated, um, although there's a fun detail where they have uh, just shut Zuko out of this secret meeting and left him to stand in the flower shop, which is probably a real flower shop, but also kind of a cover for the secret meeting room here. There's, there's just a fun little detail where he's just realizing he's just going to have to wait and, and he just kind of sees the flower next to him and kind of just casually smells it a little bit. Hmm. <laughs> That's fun. Uh, but so in the meantime, we see, you know, a fun sequence where, you know, one of these other uh, Order of the White Lotus guys uh, helps them to, uh, you know, uh, get away from the people looking for them. And uh, it's an interesting thing. So we still have those two guys on the lookout for Toph. And in fact, the last time we see them, this episode is where they're saying, let's go back to looking for the girl. So we get the sense that they're still going to be around. Um, we haven't dealt with them yet, but we've now introduced this excellent Order of the White Lotus uh, concept uh, and deepened the mystery of Iroh. And what exactly is his deal, huh? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I'll leave it there for this time. Uh, next time we're going to be doing uh, episode 12 of season two, The Serpent's Pass. And I'll talk to you tomorrow for five more minutes.